and I'm particularly excited to hear a fellow Devashri Mukherjee talk tonight, because I used to be in film studies myself, and I have to be very soft spot for Bollywood. Um, and it didn't take me long to notice that Devashri could very easily go off and on a Bollywood tune at a dinner party, and for some of them I could even join in. That was pretty very soft. Um, Devashi is a professor of film, history, and media theory at the School of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia University. She works on production studies, new materialism, feminism, film historiography, post-colonial studies, and South Asian studies. Um, and the forthcoming book, Bombay Hustle, Making Movies in a Colonial City, is about the Bombay film industry of the 1930s and investigates material relations between cinema bodies, machines, aesthetics, and environment in late colonial India. She's a core editor with the peer-reviewed journal Bioscope South Asian Screen Studies. Um, and she also curated a cinematic imagination, Joseph Wershing and the Bombay Talkies, which was an exhibition um, the rare production photographs of the 1930s at the Serendipity Arts Festival in Goa in 2017. Um, Devashri came to film through the film industry. She worked in Bombay's film and television for many years. She did camera work for television, and she was an assistant uh, director to Vishal Bar Bardwaj <laughs> <laughs> on the making of Omkara, which I'm very proud to say I have seen. <laughs> I've seen many volumes. Um, tonight, Devashri will talk about her current project, Mediated Ocean, a techno aesthetic view of migration. Yeah. Don't? Okay, so she'll tell you what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> against the week, so I really appreciate all of you being here tonight. Um, and I do have to especially thank the Institute for Ideas and Imagination for making it possible for me to be here and to speak with all of you, and the very fabulous team of Marie, Eve, and James, who make everything possible. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I only moved to Paris last month, and it's been an unsettling time for me not just because I was adjusting to a new life in a new city, but mainly because the political situation in India has been very, very disturbing in the last few months. I live in New York, uh, and, and now I live in Paris, uh, but I spent my first 28 years um, in, in India. So I spend half my time now in this new city, tracking news from India, checking in with friends and colleagues, who work in universities, legal aid groups, and news media, whose work and very existence is being systematically threatened today by various right-wing forces. So those friends in India are exhausted from this daily struggle. And I feel exhausted also by my physical distance from this very urgent existential battle uh, in the country where I grew up. But exhaustion can also produce new insights and possibly new modes of resistance. And I want to think tonight about some of these possibilities. So tonight's talk, um, somewhere between human, non-human, and woman, and actress theorizes exhaustion, is based on a chapter from my forthcoming book, which is Bombay Hustle. Um, the book is set in the 1930s and 40s, when India was still uh, colonized by the British. My contention is that our present day engagements with history and with archives can hopefully bring forth stories and experiences of struggle and resistance that can support us in our own time. So with that preface, I will begin. On May 10th, 1938, three extras or background artists drowned to death during the shooting of a stunt film called Veer Bala, or Great Woman. This incident of drowning took place at the Pawai Lake in Bombay City after seven male actors, who were all reportedly good swimmers, entered the water to film a swimming scene. According to a newspaper report, 
Hardly had 30 feet of film been shot when three of these actors showed signs of exhaustion and they sank within a very short time. These three men were K.G. Shastri, 30 years old, Sheikh Abdullah, 20, and Abdul Salam, 25. Only two of the bodies were ever retrieved. Now it takes only 20 seconds approximately to run 30 feet of 35 mm film at 24 frames per second. So 20 seconds uh, within which these men died. Moreover, they were swimming only 20 feet away from the shore. So why would three competent swimmers drown within a matter of mere seconds? So the news report actually gives us a reason. It says these men were exhausted. Clearly, they were at the limit <coughs> of human exhaustion. So starting with this anecdote, what I want to think with is how should media theory address the body as it exists at the limits of cultural practice and technological mediation? In turn, what can somatic states such as exhaustion tell us about the history of cinema, its forms, its techniques, and its place in the world? <coughs> And I'm going to go back to this image um, because, of course, these men were extras. <coughs> they were um, background artists with non-speaking roles. There is very little that I know about them except for their names. I don't have images of them. And the film itself is a lost film, so we may never be able to watch it. But it's possible that some of those men are featured in the poster of this image. Uh, because this is a scene in which the heroine is being addressed by unknown, unnamed actors. So it's possible uh, that we are looking <coughs> at those three men here. But going back to the topic at hand. So in this talk, I want to approach exhaustion as a material trace of practice. Exhaustion, or to use French, épuisement, is, as a poet said, what's left in the end. It is a residue that accrues in the shadow of cultural techniques, often quite literally as exhaust, or in French, échappement. That is the, the waste that is expelled from a machine during the course of its operation. Cinema, in my view, is an ecological assemblage that transcends ontological boundaries. As such, cinema is constituted by productive energy relations between machines and organisms, humans and non-humans. The exhaustion that builds up within this ecology offers us a generative analytic to expand film history towards a history of the body and further to realize that the body in cinema is not just the body on screen, but also includes the working body off screen. And of course, these bodies are connected. Cinema has historically been a site where people and things are activated, set into motion. When you watch a film, your body is activated by the screen. You can be moved to tears, to laughter, you can be transported into reverie. At the same time, a vast ecology of off-screen practices also participates in cinema's web of energy relations. Cinema is also an employer, and as an employer, cinema has the power to put bodies to work. The city ecology is at once energized and depleted by practices that are required to bring filmed images to the screen. So running a camera motor, transporting imported raw stock, waiting for the next lighting setup, or even writing continuity, all of these practices depend on energy intensive encounters between humans, electricity, celluloid, climate, paper, oil, and buildings. These off-screen energies are rematerialized into on-screen images and box office revenues. Energy transfers, therefore, undergird the very existence of movies in the world and are central to the historical status and significance of cinema and cinema's projects of world making. Thinking about exhaustion as corporeal depletion allows us to see connections between the image and the labor that produces it. At the same time, we are also able to reconceive cinema's relation to modernity with attention to the specificities of other places in other times, other bodies in other assemblages of power and practice. 
So in what follows, I will try and plot a map of practices, performances, and theories of exhaustion in order to draw out the connections between film as work, film as representation, and film as a commercial enterprise. My main protagonist in um, this talk is an actress from India, Shanta Apte. Now, actresses were the leading symbol of the glamour of cinema in India since the silent days. And this is just an example to give you a sense of not only was the actress the reigning symbol of cinema compared to the male hero, uh, but so, so intense was the fascination that a lot of films very directly were based on the actress as a type, uh, as you see in some of these images. During the 1930s, as silent cinema transitioned into the talkie era, the singing and speaking filmic female body added a new affective charge to the figure of the actress. So now you're not just seeing a silent film uh, female body on screen, you can hear her voice and you can hear her singing. And the early talkie period is a period before what we call playback singing, which means that the actors were singing their own songs. They were not dubbed by professional singers, as is the case in Bollywood um, today, since the 1950s. But this is still um, a pre-playback era. So the spectacularized sounding body of the woman on screen was a resolutely energetic body, a marker of the vitality of cinema and the vitality of the nation. So in another chapter, I discuss very much the importance of a discourse of energy and an aesthetic of vitality and how important that kind of cinema was to a nation that was actively uh, trying to assert itself as an energetic, able um, nation ready uh, to, end, to be sovereign and independent and self-sufficient. Now, and just another set of images uh, because they're so fabulous. <coughs> the stunt film was a very important genre at this time. And these are two very prominent um, actresses of the stunt film genre. One you must have heard of, fearless Nadia, also known as Nadia Hunterwali, because she was always featured with a hunter or a whip. Um, and then this is Pramila, um, whose real name is Esther Abraham. So just some of those images to give you a sense of how important actresses and, and the energetic body of the actress was um, at this time. Now, through her writing and her activism, Shanta Apte, in my argument, interrogates the logics of vitality that dominated the aesthetic and the industrial address of early Toffee cinema in colonial India. And she demonstrates that it is the discourse of energy that enables the extraction of labor. So I just want to show you a small clip, um, because there was a lot of demand for clips. Um, <laughs> So you can get a sense of um, Shanta Bhakti, you can see her moving and you can hear her singing. treatment accorded to her by the directors of the studio. 
the studio executive denied all her allegations. Now, Shanta Akhti's rebellion was unprecedented in its form, and it attracted all kinds of reactions. Large crowds turned up at the gates of Prabha to witness the scene of a film star on hunger strike. A constable had to be posted at the gates to keep ardent fans in check. Newspapers as far away as Singapore and Australia covered the event. Prabhat Studios issued an official statement that characterized Akte as a verbally abusive woman who was unable to convey what exactly she wanted. Overall, commentators were at a loss to explain the meaning of Akte's public protest, and the fact that the dismissal of her protest was gendered is the only coherent line that runs through all the contemporaneous reportage. Now, born in 1916, Shanta Akte's singing talent was apparent at an early age. She made her film debut at age 16 and soon became one of the great singing stars of cinema in an era before playback singing. In 1934, Akte signed a six-year contract with Prabhat Studios and appeared in some of the most famous films of her career. These films offer us a representative sample of the aesthetics of vitality that characterized Akte's star persona, a vitality that she performed using posture, gesture, stance, and voice. So you won't see her doing stunts like a fearless Nadia, but the way she holds herself, the way she sings, just certain minor gestures, are, all speak of um, a certain embodied vitality. This star persona also contributed greatly to public perceptions of Akte's so-called fighting nature. And she soon developed an image of a fiery woman who defied hypocritical social norms and advocated for gender equality. So for example, in this film, Kunku, also known as Dunya Na Mane, or The Unexpected, Akte plays the character of a young woman called Neera, who is tricked into marrying a much older man. Appalled by this um, subterfuge and her situation, Neera treats her marriage as a performative arena for embodied dissent. In a move that echoes her hunger strike, Neera refuses to consummate her marriage and asserts her control of her body as an exercise in self-determination. Some reporters also found a pattern between Akte's hunger strike and her feisty screen image as a principled opponent of social injustice. And they suggested that in her strike, she was simply living the part of Mira. In the end, however, there was no consensus on what the actress's hunger strike meant. Was it a parody of the purification fasts by Mahatma Gandhi? and surely one of the most visible and visually proliferating images of the body fasting at that time in India was of Mahatma Gandhi's body fasting and headlining newspapers very, very frequently. So was, was this her reference? Or was it a star tantrum, like many film editors and magazine uh, journalists suggested? Now this unfixability can be understood if we look at that which is the most ineffable in her performance, which is the staging of bodily depletion and insistence on embodiment as the grounds for resistance. Up until the 1940s, actors, even stars, were hired by Indian film companies on a salaried basis. Employment contracts were multi-year and they were restrictive in nature, binding the actor to a particular studio on a fixed monthly remuneration. No matter how famous they were, uh, they were contracted and they had their usual salary, 500 rupees a month, 1,000 rupees a month, whatever they had negotiated. Now, Akte was a highly prized actor, aggressively wooed by rival film companies. She was also acutely underemployed at Prabha, averaging only one film a year, at a time when most stars at her level were making three to five films a year. Akte's strike was catalyzed by her frustration over long periods of inactivity, so not overwork, underwork, a desire to seek better work and higher compensation elsewhere, and a very acute sense of the temporality of an actor's bodily capacities, especially an actress's bodily capacities. Right? With every month, with every year, you're growing older, 
and one can feel that you're losing the main assets of an actress, your beautiful good looks. Her hunger strike can be seen as a demonstration of her right to her body, including her right to the durational depletion of her body. The time spent on strike becomes unmonetizable time, some kind of waste time or excess time that provoked the studio just as much as Apte herself was provoked by her own long periods of inactivity at the studio. Now, a year after her hunger strike, still at the very height of her stardom, Shanta Apte published a very fierce polemic against India's film studios. It's called Zaumi Cinema, which translates as, should I join the movies? Now, this Marathi language monograph combines political economy analysis of the increasingly capitalist film business, detailing the systemic flaws of an enterprise that is premised on the extraction of surplus value, alongside a very unusual consideration of the body at work. Apte notes that her primary motivation for writing the te text sprang from the hundreds of fan letters that she received each day, and all the fans asked her one question, Zaumi Cinema, should I join the movies? So this was her public response, this book, to that question from the film fan who longed to become a film worker. It's meant more as a warning to film aspirants rather than an instruction manual on how to become a film star. And surely anyone reading this would immediately ditch all their plans to join the film industry because it is an insider's expose of the film industry's institutionalized bad practices. And there is simply nothing quite like it in the archives of Indian cinema. The text is marked by what has been termed recently a Marathi Marxist vocabulary. That is a set of words and phrases that were popularized in the interwar Bombay region since the Communist Manifesto was translated into Marathi in 1931. So the argument by some of these writers, and I'm talking specifically of uh, the dissertation, which is um, now a forthcoming monograph by Junaid Sheikh, who talks a lot about the Marathi Marxist vocabulary and the Marathi Marxist public sphere uh, in interwar Bombay. So her text is marked by some of this vocabulary. At the same time, she crafts her own theory of film work and labor, exploitation and resistance, which makes the text a very original expression of political thought which is grounded very firmly within Bombay and Bombay region's intellectual milieu. What is most striking is that she chooses to highlight the mundane and the everyday experience of acting work, rather than sensational stories about death and injury. Because you can imagine that one of the, the, the most strategic seeming activist uh, registers would be to talk about death like I did at the start of, of the talk. Uh, or some fatal catastrophic injury. But she eschews that kind of register and she talks about durational depletion, just everyday nuanced, um, accruing um, sense of uh, bodily distress. In a chapter that she titles, In the Furnace of Capitalism. So it's a very hyperbolic book, but this kind of vocabulary, I have not seen it in any other um, actress, memoir, autobiography, pamphlet, and so on. So in a chapter that is titled In the Furnace of Capitalism, Apte gives the reader a series of anonymized case studies to illustrate what she considers cinema's extractive effects. One of these examples seems like a very transparent description of her own experience at Prabhat as a young actress. And let's look at it. Days and then months passed like this. The poor girl would come in every day and ask, no work for me today, and go home resigned in the evening. The period of the contract was almost over, and still the young woman was given no work. She was made to just sit around for a year or two. Who then thinks about the mental state of the actress, who is kept on merely as a substitute? It gnaws at her mind. To come to the studio day after day and get no work. She must not speak to anybody, but has to stay shut up in a tiny room. Nothing to read, no other means of passing the time. She has to sit there staring at the ceiling. To come each morning with hope and return home in the evening bored and disappointed. But what did the producer tell? 
we are paying her a salary, we will give her work or make us an idol. It's for us to decide. Now, the depletion that Apte describes here is psychic and durational. And it's the kind of worker depression that is, is being theorized in, the re in recent days as the malaise of what is being called immaterial labor in the 21st century. So those of you that are familiar with, for example, the Italian autonomists, um, Kohart and Negri, will recognize this discussion of immaterial labor, which they argue something specific to this kind of post-industrial, late capitalist, 21st century um, economies. But she's already talking in these terms in, in this text. Her diagnosis is that of unfreedom, a state in which one is rendered incapable of productive activity or the growth of individual potential. Now, a physical culture movement was spreading across India at this time, paralleled by interest in nutritional science. And this is just to give you a sense of a huge proliferation of discussion, magazines, pamphlets on physical culture, on exercise, the revival of modern yoga, vitality tonics, um, such as this one and so on. Now, Apte also subscribed to modern ideas of bodily productivity. She declared um, at one instance, I had a routine, a daily routine, which I never changed, whether I had work or not. For the last seven or eight years, I keep my diet regulated. I perform two or three different exercises every day. I practice singing at least three hours a day without fail, and I take great care that my health remains good and my voice is unaffected. Now, this is not a celebration of the vital body for its own sake, however. <coughs> Apti explains, Apti explains that those qualities, form, fitness, and artistic skill, are what allows us to live with dignity. And that's, that's her quote. They are what give us our success, our money, and our fame. So what Apti is doing here is she conceives of an actor's, oh, that's fine, it's just a black side. Apte um, conceives of an actor's physical capacity and proficiency as the locus of artistic sovereignty and political subjectivity. What Apte is describing here is labor power, which she terms in Marathi karya shamta, or the capacity to work. A concept, and labor power is a concept that captured the global imagination from the 19th century onward. I think this is the other PowerPoint, but it's fine. Now, Anson, uh, Anson Rabenbach has given us a valuable account of the discovery of labor power by modern society. I just had a few extra slides. According to Rabenbach, a singularly powerful idea that defined 19th and 20th century notions of work and productivity was that the human body could be seen as a motor, as an engine. So the human body as a motor supplied a metaphor for work and energy that allied the body with modern industry and allowed scientists, philosophers, politicians, social reformers, and physiologists, all with wildly differing ideologies, to apply concepts of energy conversion and energy conservation to the working human body. The modern Western idea of labor power derives from this thermodynamic model and describes a quantifiable mechanical potential for energy expenditure. Shanta Apte saw labor power not as a mechanical or abstract potential that, that inheres or coheres in one location and can then be ex um, uh, extracted and used, but rather as an organic and highly individualized latency. In her text, uh, Should I Join the Movies, the mechanical equals the inhuman, and she calls the film industry an inhuman mechanical city that squeezes the life out of poor people. Her use of the concept of labor power is material and embodied. It is rooted in experience, even as it is firmly located, as it is in Marx, within a transactional regime of value. For our day, labor power is a very delicate relation between slowing down and speeding up, where each body has its own velocity, where bodies are vulnerable to tiredness and exhaustion, but they are also capable of being revived 
with a careful touch. Now, Aapti's commitment to the self as worker makes Karya Shanta, which is her concept, much more than simply physical wellness. And she also veers away from either Vedic notions or liberal notions of physical health as personal responsibility. So labor power for her is the capacity to produce monetary value for an employer. And hence it is the employer's responsibility to nurture the worker's mind and body. So Aapti directly asks, who is responsible for the development of the abilities of an actress? Does this responsibility not fall on the institution, the film concern to which the actress belongs? Now Aapti continues to push her distinction between human and non-human in her text. And let's look at this quote. The owners and managers of the film industry do not look at actors, actresses, and children as if they are human. They look at these people the same way they would glance at a piece of furniture. But does the shape of wooden statues ever alter? Does the voice of a sound machine ever change? But they will still take greater care of them. And actors' qualities do not remain static, they change. And that is because the actor is a human being. Now, Aapti's critique of the film industry depends on deconstructing the energy economy of human exhaustion and vulnerability. And thus, she posits a very fundamental separation of human and object in formulations that to us are clearly rife with contradictions. But they're very significant for the conceptual and political claims. The capacity to change, to change negatively, to deplete, serves as the ultimate distinction for Aapte between human and machine, where the machine is understood in its most basic sense as a technical object designed by humans to perform certain tasks. So here I just want to go to um, a, a writer and philosopher that's been helpful for me to think about some of these things. And he's French. So in his famous uh, 1958 text, Gilbert Simondon was primarily interested in this question of the relation between technical objects and humans. Simondon's opening idea in this book, uh, Mode of Existence, is that there is a crisis in human society because culture and technology have been falsely sundered, divided into two separate realms of meaning on one hand and utility on the other hand, resulting in a state of alienation. And I'm quoting from him now. While the aesthetic object, cinema for example, has been considered suitable material for philosophical reflections, the technical object, the camera for example, is treated as an instrument and has only ever been studied across the multiple modalities of its relation to man as an economic reality, as an instrument of work, or as an object for consumption. Close quotes. So for Simon Dong, man and machine, or what he calls natural objects and technical objects, they're all objects for him, are different, but they are imbricated in a coextensive <coughs> web of processual relations, which means technologies and humans are fundamentally entangled, and the techniques that link one to the other also transform and define the other. It is because we do not recognize that we are processually entangled with other objects that society looks on the machine with either fear of subjugation, enslavement, or euphoria that we can master technology, we are the victors. This kind of, um, so the fears of being replaced by the machine or being enslaved by technology mask the reality of the man-machine relation, which for Simon Don is ideally one of working alongside each other rather than working above or below one another. Now, 20th century Bombay was a major industrial hub. It was connected with global capitalist economy uh, through various channels. It is no surprise, therefore, that Bombay's human workers were compared to machines in the 1920s in the same discursive realm that Simon Don is reacting to in the 1950s, a kind of a European condition of alternating between technophobia and technoutopia. So Bombay's human workers too at this time, their capacity for work is being measured and deliberated. Their identity is abstracted into quantifiable categories such as energy and fatigue. Aapte's interest in the humanness of her labor was an explicit rejection 
of the dehumanization of fatigue and the uh, machinization, mechanization of the human in contemporaneous industrial discourse. She seizes on exhaustion as the ultimate arbiter of the boundaries of human and machine, the most evident and persistent reminder of the body's resistance to unlimited progress and productivity. And indeed, if you look at Anson Rabenbach's uh, history in the human motor, fatigue was even in Europe and America considered this ultimate nemesis uh, to industrial and technological modernity, uh, the fatigue of the human body. Now, what I want to quickly just give you a sense of is how in the early 20th century, the very concept of fatigue moved from metallurgical to the human body, this physiological discourse. So fatigue as a concept initially was being used to describe metals, metal fatigue. So in, during the First World War, for example, or both the wars, the huge demand for metal works, for airplanes, guns, tanks, machinery, vehicles that are made of metal, led to a lot of need for fast, massive, mass scale production and studies of why is it that these things are breaking down. How does one study at what point does metal start to wear to an extent that it breaks down? So that's metal fatigue. But interestingly, at some point, by the end of the First World War, that concept of metal fatigue started to be studied for the worker in the factory's fatigue. Because you can figure out metal fatigue, but you still need the human workers to make those vehicles and tanks and guns and so on. So there was a need to think at what point does the human worker's body break down and how to increase efficiency. By 1930, the scientific discourse on fatigue and stress had permeated popular discourses of physical well-being. And I've shown you some images of vitality tonics earlier in India. And here's a new one now, which uses this whole scientific language to sell the same uh, kind of tonic and it quotes uh, a fatigue test showing percentages. So many percent without having this tonic, how quickly they get fatigued, and so many percent having this tonic have less fatigue, and that there's a sample size of so many workers working for six hours. <coughs> so all of this language is also becoming very familiar across the industrialized world through also um, tailorist uh, um, techniques for rationalized uh, work. Now, labor advocates in India had been fighting for an 11-hour workday for, for a long time. And they were hoping that by doing scientific tests um, and scientific fatigue experiments, they would be able to dispel one of the oldest and most tenacious, tenacious myths of the Indian worker, which was a racist and a climatological myth that the Indian worker, because of the tropical climate, is an inherently lazy and sluggish worker. And hence, to combat this laziness and sluggishness of the tropical Indian worker's body, they have to be worked much harder than the European factory worker. So they need to be worked for longer hours. So labor advocates in India were hoping that if you did scientific tests, uh, they would be able to find out that, no, that's not true, perhaps. Now, the comparison of the human body with the machine, coupled with this allegedly Indian problem of sluggishness, allowed factory owners, labor committees, and politicians to abstract the question of embodied labor into a question of energy, efficiency, output. It is essential, therefore, again, to consider Apte's preoccupation with exhaustion and the preoccupation with saying, this is human and this is not human, within this whole discursive history. Even as the language of class struggle proliferated across Indian industrial centers in the 30s, and Bombay City is at the vanguard of mass mobilization, some of the biggest worker strikes in South Asia taking place in Bombay in the 1920s and 30s. But cinema became a blind spot in all of these debates. Producers, film workers, and even leftist and communist writers who had joined the film industry as lyricists and so on, and you would have seen a glimpse of that in the film Manto that we watched. Even these leftist writers were unwilling to concede that film work could be labor. The equation of the human body with the machine now influenced the struggles for legitimacy that were being fought by India's film workers. 
So just a quick note that um, cinema in India at this time, this mainstream commercial cinema, is still considered a highly taboo uh, cultural form, a mass form, uh, premised on sensationalism, titillating, poor working class, proletarian tastes, um, and using the talents of women from professional performing backgrounds with dubious moral uh, antecedents. So there was a huge struggle at this time for the industry to remake itself as respectable. So this art and industry um, factory versus uh, culture discourse becomes very important at this point. Film practitioners and commentators were struggling to retain the status of art for cinema against comparisons with factory work. Now Ram Gokte, the editor of this magazine, Lighthouse, and the secretary of the Motion Picture Society of India writes many strong editorials at this point trying to really define this, this difference. And he says that film production is not a manufacturing process. Individuals employed in film production cannot therefore be called workers. They are either artists or they are technical experts. Moreover, a worker implies a laborer, an individual who has more brawn than brain. Now, such ossified kind of divisions between art and industry precluded any possibility for commentators to recognize that cinema could be both. What is worth highlighting here is that Shanta Aapte, unlike maybe one other person that I've encountered in this whole 1930s discourse of today, she's one of the only two people that treats the category of film worker as a given. It's not even a question for her. And again, she serves in her text as quite exceptional. So I'm coming to the last section now, which is the most intriguing chapter in her text, um, where she discusses um, the film industrial hierarchy as the caste system. So in a very intriguing chapter titled Sapta Varana, or The Seven Pasts, Aapte likens the film industry's organizational structure to the discriminatory caste hierarchies entrenched in modern Hindu society. According to Aapte, the film industry can be divided into seven caste groups, capitalists, companies, distributors, exhibitors, advertisers, workers, and the public. And the public, the paying public, are at the very bottom of the caste chain. At the top of the caste pyramid are the Bhandavalale, or the capitalists, those with capital, very literally. They are the ones born in the house of Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth and they naturally get first place among the upper caste, says Apte in her text. For all practical purposes, Apte says, we should consider the first five groups, from capitalists to advertisers, as one big group, because they can freely eat with each other and hang out with each other. And here she's referring to the, one of the central fears um, in the caste system of caste pollution. That if I, if I cohabit, dine with or even walk next to someone of a different caste, I will be polluted. So she's saying these first guys have no such fear with each other, so they should be considered as one big dominant caste group. At the opposite end of the spectrum are the workers who she calls the slaves of the higher castes, and these are her terms slave. The worker is completely dependent on the upper caste quintet and must take the money that they are given and do whatever work they are told to do. So Aapte labels all salaried as well as daily wage workers as of the studio as workers. She's not making much of any difference between a salaried executive uh, like a director or an assistant director or a star celebrity actress uh, and a carpenter. Her agenda is to point to the very broad battle lines of class conflict within the scene ecology that is between the agents and the foot soldiers of capitalism. Therefore, complex internal differences of training, creative agency, and salary on one hand, and class, ethnicity, linguistic affiliation, gender, and even real caste divisions on the other hand, are subsumed by her under this category of worker. In Apte's taxonomic vision of the power asymmetries in the cine ecology, laborers and public together comprise the most undervalued and oppressed class. And she actually calls them the Paddalit, that is the crushed underfoot outcasts of cinema. 
And this is a very, very important term because Qabdalit is a term that was very important to prominent anti-caste thinkers of the time like Jyoti Rafule and Baba Sahib Ambedkar. So the framing of cinema's industrial hierarchy as a seven-tier caste system allows Apti to magnify the crisis of class oppression. But there is much more here in this analogy than the immobility of caste structures because you're born into a particular caste and you can't do anything about it. And uh, in the interest of time, I'll just quickly go over this uh, faster than I had wanted to. And I'm happy to take questions. Um, one of the other things that I'm suggesting she's really trying to signify here is a certain equivalence, not a direct kind of an equation, but a certain equivalence between the Dalit body and the film worker's body at a level of embodiment as the suffering body, as a body that is subjugated or controlled by something else, whether it is capital or whether it's, the, it's a higher caste. And what's very interesting for me in the longer chapter where I go into it in detail is to think about how Ambedkar and Apte come to this question in their own ways. Because Ambedkar goes from the embodiment in caste towards class. So he uses class as a way to make the, the Dalit struggle into a more universal struggle. Because embodiment is highly particular. So he needed, uh, and this is something that Anupama Rao, who teaches at Columbia University, discusses in depth, that he needs a kind of universal abstract category like class in order to be able to mobilize um, uh, uh, Dalit uh, consciousness. And Apte does the opposite. She uses caste to particularize the class hierarchies in the film industry. So this, I think, is very, very interesting. And another reason to bring them together is to think that despite all the many, many differences, one has to also read Apte's work as a work of political thought and philosophy, not just some polemic or memoir written uh, by an actress. So reading across Apte's hunger strike and her book, we see many continuities as well as contradictions a push and pull of ideas that were hers in her time and ideas that are ours today. What is most significant in this dialogic play is that we witness one actress's process of becoming cine worker, becoming actress, her attempts at individuation on the terrain of cinema. Now, Shanta Apte's hunger strike eventually led to the termination of her contract with Prabhat Studios, and she started her own film company, Shanta Apte Concerns. It is important to note here that the initial talky years were a highly litigious period in Indian cinema. And actresses, who were the prized locus um, of film's commercial potential in these years, were very frequently involved in legal contractual tussles with studios. And newspapers you'll see case after case after case of actresses being hauled into court or actresses hauling producers into court. Industry commentators regularly made disapproving noises about these litigious women. But the very publicness of these legal scandals allowed the film actress to produce herself as a modern worker, completely like now in the public domain, on a continuum, with the sensationalist modern print forms of newspaper, the courthouse, and so on. Apte's industrial negotiations as a female singing star accentuate another vector of labor, one that is gendered. But Apte refuses to explicitly acknowledge it in her book. Nowhere does she talk about her being a woman, the female body, or anything like that. But she does spectacularize the cultural meaning and the economic value of the female body in a fledgling film industry through a very performative act of resistance, the hunger strike. Apte keenly understands the temporality of physical beauty one of the central commodities of the film industry, and an onus that is particularly onerous for the female film worker, more than the male. So to conclude, what is cinema? This is an originary question for the field of film studies and has been addressed by generations of scholars. In my book, I have shifted the focus of the question of what is cinema towards processes and practices of becoming, not a question of this is and this is not. But what does it mean to become cinema at a particular time in a particular place? 
How did people and assemblages attempt to remake themselves as individuals and as industries under the sign of this thing called cinema? Shanta Apti gives us one possible answer, that to individuate oneself as a cine worker, it was necessary to redefine the relation between the body and this whole ecology around the body that is defined by cinema, what I call a cine ecology. This whole assemblage of technology, ideology, finance, objects, and environments that constitute this cinematic milieu. Embodiment for Arte is the key to unlocking the historical status of cinematic labor. Itineraries of exhaustion and fatigue and depletion yield new uh, meanings for that experience that we call the cinematic. Exhaustion and death are to be found at the center of several cinematic anxieties. And this was just a, a, some very evocative images from the Goshen archive that Marie talked about, that I did an exhibition with. Uh, they give you a sense of all the things that are part of that cinematic milieu, that ecology, that actually does have cables and lights and, and wooden partitions and women and makeup and fabric, all as part of that same ecology. But exhaustion and death, which is not here in this thing, are concerns with the death of the medium itself, of cinema, right? Is this the end of cinema? We were asking when the digital happened. The politics of archives, the problem of film conservation. These are anxieties that arise from the fact that cinema as a material, cinema as stuff, is exhaustible. The physicality of celluloid assumes depletion. Indeed, depletion of the film print is a prerequisite for its projection and for its continued life. A critical look at exhaustion then allows us to connect material histories of celluloid and equipment with experiential histories of embodied film practice. Film work comes into view as labor and creativity shows itself as monetized labor power. One last thing. Even though Apte insists, unlike me, and it's quite the opposite of what I'm doing before, but Apte insists the human and the non-human are different. My, my intention has been to try and understand why. Where did that insistence come from? And to try and locate it within everything that's happening in the 1930s as it directly affects her life. As an employee, as a woman, as, um, as an anti-colonial person, as an anti-capitalist woman, and so on. And I, I would contend that her corporeal politics may depend on the difference between the human and the object, but it doesn't depend on a denigration of objects. There is no suggestion in her work of human mastery over technological tools. Rather, she points to the danger of conflating or confusing different modes of existence and what are the material implications of reducing the human to the status of the object and the object as a commodity under the very specific regime of 20th century capitalism. So from such a perspective, right, of the human body as commodity under capitalism, Shanta Apte and the three young men that we started with, Shastri, Abdullah, and Salam, each occupy differential positions of power within a highly unequal cine ecology that produces the exhaustion of the human alongside the fatigue of cameras, studio buildings, and microphones. So I will stop there. I hope you're not exhausted. So this book has not been read by many people. 
um, it it is a book that she self published. So she she published it herself, uh, and it has been out of print I think since year one of this publication. Though in the the copy that I have, which I got from her daughter, it says published in twenty languages, new edition coming up, and part two is going to come up, which is not depressing, but it's called fun in the studios. I think it was a big joke, um, but she did like dangle that that there is fun in the studios as well. So no, uh, I haven't seen any reviews of the book. I haven't seen um, journalists or reporters even dismissing the book. Nothing. There's a lot of writing about her strike and a lot of dismissal of her strike, and it goes on for months and years after that. Oh, Shanta Apte, who likes to do these publicity stunts. Yeah. When she was fired, was that the end of her cinema career, or did she do that after she was fired? No, so she started her own production firm. Did she continue acting? Yeah, so it wasn't a firm where she was making her own movies. It was basically like she was now a freelancing actor. So she made movies then in Lahore, she made movies in Bombay. Her acting career did continue, but her best, most popular films were at the heart. Um, she didn't reach that kind of a status uh, after that. But she did make films for at least another decade, after which she moved pretty much to Marathi theatre. Yeah. So, when there was all this denigration of mm -hmm. the, the hunger strike, mm -hmm. was did she have any aside from publishing this memoir? Did she have at the moment any audibility? <laughs> did anybody hear her mm -hmm. justifications for why it was happening? Did she try? Yeah. So the same magazines that printed, for example. Prabhat, so this is a Prabhat statement on the hunger strike, that's her studio statement. So like three pages after, Ishanta Apte's statement on her hunger strike. So she does, uh, so her voice is very available, and her reasons, and very detailed account of why she did the strike, why was she upset with the studio, everything they did wrong. So it was all printed and published. Um, what's interesting is the whole discursive attempt by a lot of male journal, I mean, they're all men, journalists, <laughs> reporters, um, and studio executives who control the discourse, right, because they're writing in these prominent trade magazines. Very interesting to see their attempts to frame it um, as just um, being petulant, uh, trying a stunt or something. Yeah. That's a question. Jane's um, struggle and fights, you know, in, in cinema, in the film industry. Um, um, so first, very small question. So I guess, or it, has it ever been translated in, in another language than in the, or English, or, and I think it should be translated to French. So that's the first thing. And second thing uh, is a real question. Um, so she apparently stresses on the um, comparison with the caste system. I was wondering um, to um, how how she um, if if she uses you know not only a comparison but also if she if she um, offers an analysis of how the colonial colonial side and colonial rule and colonial administration would actually shape the film industry and how she you know if she if she articulates both mm -hmm. systems. Uh, and again, uh, it's it's incredibly interesting to see how she um, she stresses the fact that the film industry is the mirror of society, as you know, as, as you know, the making of you know, the production of films and, uh, and screens in a way, but also as as a as a, a place of um, of domination, etc. And um, I don't know any any analog uh, works, for instance, in a, you know published in this same period uh, in colonized countries, for instance. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I know more the, the Western Africa context, but I know no no work on this kind of context. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so translation is 
translation. I think that's great because uh, I do want this work to be out and many people to do what they want with it, find different meanings from it. I want it to be read. Um, so I have, um, I have, I mean, I translated it from the Marathi to the English. Um, so I need to talk to the daughter, find her again. I've lost her. It's been many years since I first met her, and she gave me this photocopy. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube today, please contact me. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I will first try to get the English publication, English translation out, uh, just so that more and more people can read it and, and make sense of it and, um, and troll its riches. The colonial question, no. I, she doesn't explicitly say anything about India's status as a colonized uh, land at this time. Um, her focus is mostly on the capitalist yeah. Indian yeah. producers. Um, and and certain questions about culture uh, and cultural denigration. So trying to revive why is there no interest in the history of Indian cinema? This industry has no regard for its own past and so on. Um, but no. Thank, Thank you, you that's uh, <laughs> it's perplexing. <laughs> I see some people dying to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. I haven't came across this book, and it's a crazy thing uh, to discover. It's um, because Soraya has been working on the Prabhat Studios for a long time, and she just defended a dissertation on the studio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. <laughs> So um, I was wondering if um, in her writings did she mention any of uh, the directors of the studio and especially Chantaram? Yeah. Because it was quite a, a, tense, um, yeah, a tense relationship that they built together and because also Chantaram was really appreciated by the press, the media uh, in general and uh, so I was wondering about this mm -hmm. and um, just a, li a little question um, on the word if you can come back on it. Okay. Thank you. So yes, I was like looking at every word with the magnifying glass, where are the names, can I recognize any people? No. Okay. Uh, the only reference to Prabhat directly is when she mentions uh, her, her actor's process for preparing for a particular scene in Kung Fu. So that the scene early in when, when she is being viewed uh, by a prospective groom. Uh, and she's smiling because she thinks the nephew is the guy she's going to yeah. be married to. Mm -hmm. So she talks about that scene. Okay. And she mentions the name of the film and she mentions her character, Neera. But there's no mention of Shantaram, director. There's a mention only of Falke because of the why have people forgotten Falke. Um, but yeah, there isn't. And that's, there's just like no real proper names, names in the thing. Um, so Paddalit, so I'm, I'm not an expert on the study of caste and its uh, deep and complex history in India. But uh, this is basically, I'm drawing on it as a history of a changing terminology. So Paddalit literally means crushed under your feet. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a way to kind of name those that were called untouchables, mm -hmm. whom Gandhi called the Hari mm -hmm. But a more visceral embodied term to really that that the anti-caste thinkers thought was actually more accurate mm -hmm. for their daily um, experience. Uh, which is also the word from which the word Dalit now comes, which is the, the, the term that radical uh, thinkers um, and also other people have chosen to name themselves um, in direct opposition to uh, all, all uh, the structural inequalities of caste in India. So it's interesting to see that that word appears as Paddalit quite a few times in her text as a description for the worker's condition. And she's not talking about any training classes? Because I've seen some other training uh, classes. Yeah, 
training classes, you know, with the, the sports, um, you know, trainers or even uh, for singing because she's done a lot. Uh, yeah, she just sing with them. she talks about what I mentioned that she did three hours of like hours every day, three hours of training, vocal training every day. Yeah. Um, but it's as if it was uh, her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Or you know, if you're reading this in a publicity by a studio, which is if it's in a film magazine, it's often paid publicity. Who knows, right? Yeah. Yes. James. Thank you. Thanks so much. Anna. This was a really fantastic talk. There's so much in here. Um, and sort of oddly, we're reading a lot of the same stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about that. But I, I guess one of my kind of elite questions would be um, in this kind of uh, uh, scheme of exhaustion that you're drawing up, mm -hmm. is there a place for the viewer mm -hmm. um, in, in this sort of uh, uh, kind of system of exhaustion? And, and the reason I ask that mm -hmm. is uh, because one of my guys, uh, Hugo Winsterberg, who's one of the sort of great theorists of industrial psychology and the kind of yeah, exactly. He, he is also the sort of the, the first theorist of cinema in the in the photo play of 1914, and so I found myself wondering if if within the sort of um, reception register, mm -hmm. if there's also something to say about this uh, kind of dynamic of labor and exhaustion mm -hmm. in the early 20th century. Thank you. So that's another chapter. Um, I. I mean, I do get into uh, a lot of these questions in order to lead up to this place because I'm interested in trying to understand how does one think energy in cinema. And one of the places we have been able to think, the theorists uh, in Europe and America have thought about energy in cinema, is through these questions of what is the impact on the spectator, uh, the eye, the body, the consciousness, and so on. So I do discuss via what Benjamin uh, ideas of both innovation, like exhaustion, um, which of the cinema is supposed to ha have this kind of effect on the body, but also this act concept of innovation, which for him is this radical potential for a collective awakening that cinema might be able to um, uh, to catalyze. So I, I so I do discuss some of these theories of exhaustion and uh, energizing via some of the Euro-American films, but also through some of the, because there isn't theoretical writing as such that I have found for the 20s and 30s from India, but there's a lot of film magazine editorials and articles that I have tried to use as a, a kind of theorizing of these questions, but from another place. So there is a lot of that. Um, and I've drawn a little bit on some of the ideas of shock and thrill to try and think about how does the cine modernity, uh, phenomenological, sensorial thinking around the 20s and 30s by the European philosophers, how does that hold in India? Is there a direct kind of a transplant? Is there something more complicated to be done there? So yes, so it, I do, I do, that's the only place I get in the reception of it. But I'd love to hear more about um, your friendship with most of us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Devashri, for this really wonderful talk. Um, so I, I, I wonder, does she, um, does Shanta ever um, portray any of the, the personalities that she portrays in her films? Mm -hmm. you know, particular way to connect to uh, the ideas she's trying to advance. Um, I was thinking of you know all these kind of modern films that portray exhaustion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know Charlie Chaplin, of course, but mm -hmm. also uh, 
uh, René Clair à nous la liberté. Mm -hmm. um, and is, the, is there anything in the actual acting uh, mm -hmm. that you can connect to mm -hmm. the writing? So the, um, the thing that I was thinking was, so she repeatedly, in some of her biggest hits at that time, plays um, this very contradictory figure of someone that's coded visually as very traditional. Right, like a good Indian woman, uh, all often doing devotional practices, praying to God, singing devotional songs, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, has this um, has a rebellious streak where she defies some of the traditions. Like, how do you deny sex to your husband as a Hindu married woman, which is her main thing in uh, the unexpected. But she has to develop, I mean, the writers uh, develop this whole kind of rhetoric to justify that it is her Indian values and her Hindu values that allow her to not do something that is against her principles. But she will still wear the kumku, that's why it's called kumku, she will still wear the thing in her hair to show that she's a married woman and she will pray for her husband's long life and all of that stuff. Um, so. That kind of um, highly um, rebellious, resistive character often played on this, obviously, this terrain of gender equality. It's always a woman's question that she's fighting. Um, that becomes the thing that defines her star persona, which is why the journalists at the time of her strike say, oh, this makes sense to us because this is what she is on screen. So there is that, that correlation that even they make um, at the time. Um, and I just have a slightly extra thing that I add to that, which is that the way she performs, her gestural use, the use of her, the way she sings, these also add to not a kind of a radical rebellious persona, but a hugely vital and energetic persona, which is why to me it also makes sense to then dismantle that to an act of hunger strike, of de-energizing oneself. Um, yeah. And maybe it's because also I remember she she used when she was young to sing in Minas. Yes. You know, and because of that also experience, it can explain uh, uh, political, um, you know, um, values and uh, and I was wondering also um, because she um, she talks also about Satyagraha in mm -hmm. uh, an article mm -hmm. when she's talking about her strike mm -hmm. it's maybe also totally linked to Gandhi oh yeah such. no definitely Gandhi is is part of the in many imaginations that she draws on it's just that part of her use of the hunger strike is philosophically the opposite of Gandhi's use of the hunger strike. Hers is a goal-oriented, uh, individualistic um, protest, which makes sense in a different way from Gandhi. For Gandhi, it is not a goal-oriented thing. It's for the purification of the self. You're not, you're not blackmailing somebody by saying, either you change my contract or I will continue on hunger strike. So they're philosophically at the opposite end. But of course, it's part of the imagination of the hunger strike. There's other people also going on hunger strike at this time that are philosophically and ideologically different from Gandhi, but they use some of these techniques. So anarchist, revolutionaries, terrorists um, like Bhagat Singh that go on hunger strike in colonial captivity to protest against their treatment. So there's, there's many different kinds of ideological uses of the hunger strike at this point. And yeah, she does use the word satyaka, which is a quest for truth. It's a term coined by Dhamma. But it also sounds like it's inactivity that makes her exhausted. Mm -hmm. What she's talking about, mm -hmm. she's talking about being, you know, completely bored, yeah. uh, having to wait around all the time. Yeah which oftentimes is also sort of like a metaphorical for a lot of other women's type of activities, mm -hmm. right? There's a mm -hmm. notion of that home. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, to what extent do you think that plays into 
your, your thinking? That's great actually. Um, because what you're pointing to is the fact of the actually existing daily experiences of most women of her class and her caste status in India at the time. She is, by the way, a, a brown man. So there's, we can get into that whole, this, her discussion of caste is very complex. Uh, I couldn't get into it here today. Um, so you're right. And I think in some ways, I was discussing this the other day with someone. The reason why she does not foreground the fact that she is a woman actor um, and the fact of her femaleness is because she actually is trying to make a way as just, I'm an actor in the world, my gender doesn't matter, I can be an actor, I can be a producer, I can be a singer, I can do all of these things. So she's in some way perhaps also trying to say that I can be a financially independent person, unlike women at home living a life of domesticity. But it's interesting to think the condition of inactivity or indoorness, uh, seclusion, as part of the condition of segregated, because there's also women's segregation from, for her caste and class in India at this time, uh, in seclusion. Um, that's very interesting. I have to think more about it. Thank you. So I, I did miss the first 10 minutes, so it may be that you covered something that I was going to ask about. But I was curious about the um, connections between her sort of orientation to her actors as exploited labor, mm -hmm. um, the extent to which this was it, this was drawing on events that were taking place in other countries. Mm -hmm. It's like the Screen Workers Guild in the United States, I think, started in 1933, which is around the same time as the mm -hmm. things are talking about here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know very much about the Indian movement in India. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just curious about these other kinds of influences, both mm -hmm. within the country and in, um, in, in acting in other countries, and how aware she was of that, mm -hmm. and what influencing her in her writing. No, that's great. Um, it must have influenced her. The thing that I have been trying to find, and I haven't been able to, is what was she reading? Like, is there any way I could look at her library? Was there any place where she said, this is what I read today? <laughs> so I don't know that. But I know that um, part of, amongst the many popular film journals of the time that she would have been reading as an industry insider, uh, were journals like Film India, for example, um, or Cinema, and I think another one called Movie Show, which did report on uh, union activities um, and picketing by film unions in Hollywood. Uh, and not in big film unions, particular kind of vocational unions. So she w would definitely be aware uh, that film workers in other parts of the world were organizing uh, as workers. Uh, what's interesting is that, like her, there were all these other leftist uh, writers uh, in Bombay who were also aware of this. In fact, they had traveled to a lot of these countries, uh, but they were only interested in factory work. They were unable to see that in their studios there was people that were also worthy of being thought of. So yeah, she's definitely aware of, aware of all this. And of course the daily strikes that are happening up just outside the studio in, in the city in Bombay, Pune, in Dabat, various places. Yeah. Thank you. People